Previously on logic components, what we did was we looked at gates. We looked at how we could use gates, you know, string them together to create other kinds of components. And yeah, essentially it sort of went from there, right, step by step until we had, well, components that were able to store a little bit of information. Now, here's the deal. There was one kind of component that we didn't really get around to, well, talking about, and that would be the counter. Clearly, a computer needs some way of, well, holding a digit and then counting up, right? Essentially telling it to go plus one, plus one, plus one, and get values that are larger and larger. So today, we're going to do just that. We're going to go take a look at a very simple counter circuit and yeah, see some variations of it. All this and more on this Random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So today, let's take a look at counters, but before we go into that, I need to recap on just one particular flip-flop, and that would be the JK flip-flop. Now, recall that a JK flip-flop is essentially, well, a simple clocked way of remembering a little bit of information. You have your J and K pins that act as set or reset, though of course the value doesn't change until the clock pulse comes along. As an added advantage over its non-clocked counterpart, what you could do is you could turn both J and K high. And when you do that, what happens is the internal state actually toggles. Again, only when a clock pulse is available. So yeah, that is essentially the entire mechanics of a JK flip-flop. And uh, well, you can see the truth table on screen right now. That's the idea. You can set, you can reset, and you can toggle the value. Again, dependent on a clock pulse. As it turns out, we could actually string together a couple of these JK flip-flops and it becomes a counter. By stringing them together and connecting them strategically, they will actually generate binary numbers for us and at a clock pulse, increase the value. Today, we're going to look at two variants of this circuit. The first one is a more intuitive version and you'll see it's actually pretty smart, but unfortunately, there are some drawbacks with that implementation. We'll then move on to see the proper way of doing it, the one that works around this problem. And yeah, that is how we will end things off. So without further ado, let's jump in to take a look at our first variant. Before we begin analyzing the actual circuit, let's see it in action first. Here are our four JK flip-flops that are connected in a certain way. They're all hooked up to this switch, which we will basically use as a manual clock, right? When we press this, we're supposed to see the numbers go up. I also have the outputs linked out here so you can see the values clearer. This will be the binary value that we're actually generating, and uh, I'll display it as a single hex digit as well, just, you know, for fun. So here goes. I'm going to press the button, and there you go, we've counted up. I can press this as many times as I like, and you can see that the number is essentially counting up. Of course, this is 4 bits, right? So we have a 4-bit number here. It will run from the value 0 up to 15, or in this case, displayed as hex, we'll count up to 9, We'll see A, B, C, D, E, F, and that wraps all the way back down to zero. So yeah, this is just a general picture of how our counter is supposed to work, right? What it's supposed to do, which, well, as this name implies, would be to count. Let's now jump in and take a look at the circuit itself. Now let's zoom this up a little, and uh, first and foremost, let's take a look at what information is actually going in, right? It's feeding to J and K. This is actually just a power source. This is just one. This is just high. This is being fed to every single J and K you actually see. What this means is we're permanently working in toggle mode. As long as a clock pulse comes along, our flip-flop will toggle. So this is very interesting because, well, essentially all our flip-flops are permanently connected in this state. In fact, our input the thing that we're actually modulating is our clock signal. So yeah, in case you're not aware, right, this little notch here, that means we're accepting a clock input at this point. So what's making everything click is actually a clock signal. But what's more interesting is how the clock signal is being forwarded from one flip-flop to another. So before we look at, you know, the rest of the flip-flops and how the clock signal actually propagates there, let's take a look at our first flip-flop. Every single time I click this button, 
I'm sending a clock pulse through to the flip-flop itself, right? And what that means is that will cause the internal value to switch over, to toggle from zero to one. So yeah, again, ignoring the rest of the values, every time I click this, I'm just flipping the value, well, from zero to one, right? So yeah, that's the idea. Let me just run this whole thing through and reset it back to zero. Now, what is truly ingenious about this particular setup is how the clock pulses are actually being forwarded from one flip-flop to another. Now, what we have here are our two outputs, Q and Q0, right? So Q represents the actual state, the actual value held within the flip-flop itself, uh, whereas the other one is actually the inversion. So we tend to call this Q0, even though it's not actually labeled here. The cool thing is we are using that as the clock signal for the next gate. I should mention that all of these JK flip-flops have their clock signal set to uh, rising edge, right? So that is what's going to trigger the flip-flop to move from one state to another. And yeah, watch what happens when I actually press this button the first time. This line drops to low. So essentially, we have a falling edge here. That will not trigger the next flip-flop. When I hit this button the next time, the value of Q from here is going to go from high to low. And as a result, the value at Q0 is going to go from low to high. That creates a rising edge that causes the next flip-flop to come on. So yeah, notice how essentially, well, the clock pulse coming in here comes out of this flip-flop at half the rate. This second flip-flop is in turn connected to the third in the same way. So watch what happens when I hit this button next. That is going to cause this line here to go high. That in turn creates a clock pulse for our second flip-flop, which then causes this to go to zero, which causes this to go high, and that triggers our third flip-flop. So there is this cascading chain of events, right? When I hit this button, that is how the value propagates its way through to the third flip-flop. Let's try that again, right, for our last one. In this state, when I hit this, this is going to go high. That triggers this, causing this to go high. That triggers this, causing this to go high. And that causes our last flip-flop to change its state, like so. So yeah, this is really smart, because by just connecting all J's and K's to high, they're always in toggle mode. The rest of our connections causes the same clock signal to get halved each time. A clock signal happening here is going to happen half as often here, a quarter as often here, and an eighth as often here. As a result, we get a counting kind of effect. We get our binary numbers. Of course, do note that our most significant digit, that is, well, the digit that represents 2 to the power of 3 or 8 in this case, is all the way here at the right. This is 2 to the power of 2, right? This is 4, this is 2, this is 1, right? So yeah, the least significant bit is here. It is also the bit that changes the most often. So yeah, there you go. That is a counter circuit. Very, very smart. By just creatively, you know, manipulating the clock signals, we can get the effects we want without having to think of feeding different values to J and K. Now, one more point to note before ending off this part, and that is, note that I'm always using Q0 to feed the next flip-flop. If I don't do that, right, if I take it out and if I feed it using Q instead, what you'll get well, it's actually still a valid counter behavior, but now it counts in reverse. Yeah, remember, what triggers our flip-flops to change is a rising edge, right, going from low to high. When we do this, we are still creating changes in the state, but this time it happens at the sort of opposite time, right? It happens when the internal state has gone from zero to one, as opposed to the other case where the internal state has actually gone from one to zero. So yeah, this is still a valid connection, but what happens now is that our counter is counting backwards. And there you have it. That is the simplest way to build a counter. And as you can see, when we press the increment button, well, the right thing happens. We are getting a value that is larger and larger. So that's great. But turns out there is a little bit of a problem here. To understand this, we first need to understand the concept of a propagation delay. Here's a new. We like to imagine that when we say raise a high over here, everything just follows suit, right? The high state immediately, you know, propagates outwards and everything is immediately set to high. 
all the components that are listening to that signal will respond immediately. For the most part, we could see things that way and you know, we'll be fine. But when we start to string together multiple components, we have to start to think about how each component introduces some delay. Ultimately, your components are made up of transistors and transistors need just a little bit of time to respond right, to these changes in voltage. Again, because we're stringing a large enough number of transistors together, these delays add up. And in the case of this circuit in particular, well, they actually cascade along. Because we have a bunch of flip-flops that are basically feeding each other, notice that when you actually press the button, well, the signal takes some time to go from one flip-flop to another. This delay is added then to the delay it takes for that second flip-flop to send a message over to the third, and so on. The last flip-flop down the line is going to have to wait quite a long time right, to go through all those propagation delays before it actually reaches that last flip-flop. And what happens is when you build a circuit like this, it may take a little bit of time to, well, do what it's supposed to do. So yeah, that's the problem. The response isn't instantaneous. Let's now take a look at a circuit that doesn't rely on this whole, well, one flip-flop forwarding a clock to the other. And without this mechanic, you'll see how we can actually work around this problem. Unfortunately, this circuit is a little bit more complex, um, but well, the principle of it kind of remains the same. Let's take a look. We still have our four JK flip-flops, right? And we still have a clock signal that is essentially pushing each flip-flop state forward. However, there are two major differences here. As described previously, the whole act of forwarding the signal from one flip-flop to another is too slow. So instead of doing things that way, we're going to use one common clock signal, right? So as you can see, whenever I actually hit my clock, that is going to go through a clock rail here. And yeah, it's the same clock feeding every single flip-flop. Because all the flip-flops are going to be clocked at the exact same rate now, we can no longer sort of just short circuit all the J's in case to one. Right, we can't just say toggle every single time. Instead, now we need to make some decisions about you know, when we actually want to toggle and when we want to actually keep the value the same. As it turns out, that is not too hard. The idea is this, as usual, our least significant bit is here on the left. The only time that this guy can move forwards is when the state of this is at one. Right, when it is one and I tell it to move forwards, this guy of course has to go back to zero but that would trigger the next guy to increase, right? Its value from zero to one. So what happens is after we clock it once, this value goes high. Now that this value is high, it's feeding J and K, and that means this flip-flop here is ready to toggle to the next state. And that's exactly what happens when we fire off the clock the next time. When it fires off, it sees one here at J and K. Because it sees that, the internal state here is changed. Conversely, at this step, for example, because these values are zero and zero, that change will not happen. This guy stays at one. That is the idea. Now, what about our third flip-flop, our second most significant flip-flop? This one has to change only when both its predecessors are now at one. And that is where the stuff at the top starts to come into play. We have an end gate here that is actually taking in the values from the first two flip-flops. Now, in this particular case, both these flip-flops give one, and that is why this end gate gives me a value of one here, and that means on the next clock pulse, this is the flip-flop that will increase its value to one. This does not happen again for the next three clicks, because this end gate will never produce an output of true until both the first two flip-flops give me a value of true. So you can see when I hit it here, nope, right? The value is still low. Again, it's still low. Again, now finally it's ready to go high, right? So when I press it again, this is going to finally switch its state. Now, same deal for the last one, except the last one is now a three input end gate because this last guy here can only change its value when all the previous three flip-flops actually give me a true output. That is the case right now, so again, when I hit the button, 
every single flip-flop changes its state. So yeah, I think you can see the idea now, right? Every time I hit the button, a flip-flop can only change its value if its predecessors are at 1. So yeah, essentially, the behavior at the end of the day is exactly the same. The only difference is that now, we are no longer forwarding clock signals. Instead, we are making a decision as to whether or not we are toggling at a particular flip-flop. And how we make that decision is by using end gates. So yeah, that is the sort of improved version of the circuit in which we are now sharing one clock signal across all the four flip-flops. By doing things this way, we no longer have to worry about the propagation delays. Each flip-flop is no longer dependent on the flip-flop that comes before it. And there you go, that was the, well, improved version of our circuit. Hopefully you can see how, well, we work around the whole propagation delay problem. Our clock, right, which is actually our trigger, is now just linked all the way across, right? It's the same trigger pulse. You don't rely on the fact that one flip-flop is going to forward it to the other. And as a result, we are not worried about propagation delay. In fact, no matter how many flip-flops we chain together, our total delay to get the result is just the delay of one flip-flop plus the delay of one end gate. That's it. We're not forwarding the message, so we don't incur that delay that goes all the way. Now that you've seen these two methods, hopefully you can sort of compare and contrast the two. Clearly, the underlying concept stays the same. Essentially, each flip-flop is made to toggle, but at half the speed of the previous one. For this to work, both circuits have to think about when to actually do the toggling action. The first circuit, well, just keeps the toggle pulse on all the time. J and K are always high. But the clock signal comes in half as often. So yeah, in that case, the clock signal is the one that is actually going at half rate each time. For our second circuit, we have the same clock rate. Every single flip-flop is being clocked at the exact same time. And so in order to have that halving effect, we are going to have to selectively deal with our J and K. That is where the additional end gates come in. They are the ones who make the decision whether you want to actually raise J and K to high. If you do, a toggling happens. Otherwise, it will be both low and the old value stays along. That is the general idea, right? That is the general similarities and differences between these two sets of circuits. So yeah, there you have it. That would be our counter circuits. It's really cool, right? Because, you know, based on all the things we've seen, we've seen transistors, we've seen how we can use transistors to build logic gates. We've seen how we can use logic gates to build our more complex components like a JK flip-flop. And now we've seen how we can use these more complex components to build even more complex components, in this case, our counter. Hopefully that has been an interesting sort of, you know, progression from the smallest to a higher level of abstraction. But yeah, hopefully that was insightful for you. If you haven't seen any of those videos that I've mentioned, right, I'll put playlists in the video description there is quite a lot of content to check out if you are interested in this area. Anyway, that's it. That's all there is for this particular episode. I hope it's been useful for you. But until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.